The transversal spinalis muscles attach to the back of the vertebrae along the spine from the sacrum right up to the axis, all the way up, which is the top of the spine near the second vertebrae. They consist of three bundles which arise from the transverse processes along the edge of the spine. We have the rotatories. Now, the rotatory muscles are more horizontal in terms of fiber orientation. Now, the rotatories pass towards the lamina and the vertebrae above. And then we have the multifidus. Now, the multifidus is commonly related to spinal stability. It's actually a very important muscle. Now, the multifidus passes to the spinous processes of the vertebrae that are located two to four levels above. So it has a bit of a different fiber orientation. And then we get into the semispinalis muscle. Now, the semispinalis muscle, these muscles pass to the spinous processes of the vertebrae and are located four to six levels above, covering other layers. So we have the rotatories, which is more orientated horizontally, the multifidus is a little more of an angle, and the spinalis, the semispinalis, which is basically more vertical. Now, when we view the transversal spinalis muscle from behind, it actually forms what we call a chevron formation, which is an inverted V. Now, actions, the fibers, they run diagonally from inferior to superior, and when these are contracted bilaterally, they move the vertebrae into extension. And when they are contracted from medial to lateral, we get side bending on one side. And when we're contracted from anterior to posterior, we're going to get rotation of the spine. So these are very important deep structures of the spine. Now I'd like to go over some of the deep muscles of the spine, but up near the cervical area, right near the base of the occiput, the base of the skull. Now, these muscles are analogous to the transversal spinalis muscles we just covered, except that they insert on the occiput. Now, in terms of the muscles, we have the rectus capitis posterior minor. Now, that would be the one on the inside here. So we have four muscles here, but the ones right on the inside here, see right here, good? These muscles run from the posterior arch of C1 to the inferior occipital ridge. So right up here. And on the outside here, we have the rectus capitis posterior major. Now, this, these muscles originate from the spinous processes of C2 and insert just lateral to the minor. So we have the rectus capitis posterior minor and rectus capitis posterior major. Now, if we start going over to the side here, we have two muscles which are the obliquus capitis. We have the superior muscle up here, and we have the inferior muscle down here. Now, the obliquus capitis superior originates from the transverse process of C1 and inserts on the occiput. Lateral to the rectus capitis posterior major, just posterior to the mastoid process, which is right over to the side here, of the temporal bone. Now, for the obliquus capitis inferior down here, this muscle runs from the spinous processes of C2 to the transverse processes of C1. Now, the actions of these muscles are extension, side bending, and rotation of C1 on C2. So I'm going to go over a group of muscles called the erector spinae. Now, this is three particular muscles, and an easy way to remember these is I love spines. Now, the I stands for iliocostalis, L for longissimus, and S for spinalis. And as you can see here by the size of the drawing on here that uh, Mickey has donated her body to science once again, once again to anatomy, which I do greatly appreciate, uh, we used uh, body paint this time instead of using the usual markers and I think it'll be a little bit easier to get off. So, yes, exactly. So let's just go over the iliocostalis on the lateral side here. Now, the lateral side will have the iliocostalis cervicus. Now, this runs from the upper six ribs to the transverse processes of the lower cervical spine. 
then we have the Iliocostalis thoracus. Now, the Iliocostalis thoracus runs from the lower six to the upper six ribs. And then we have the Iliocostalis lumborum. Now, this muscle here on the outside, it's delineated here, this originates viva the iliac crest down below, the lumbar fascia, which is a sheet-like structure made of dense connective tissue, and it inserts on the lower ribs. And then if we move over here just a little bit medial, we'll run into the longissimus muscle. Now, the longissimus capitis, and you'll see that it runs all the way up here. I think we just turn the head a little bit to the side there. Goes right to the top here. Turn back again. Now, the longissimus capitis originates from the transverse processes of T3 to C4 and inserts on the mastoid process right at the top here, which is part of the temporal bone. And then we move down a little bit here and we're going to get into the longissimus cervicus. Now, the longissimus cervicus runs from the transverse process of the upper thoracic vertebrae to the lower cervical vertebrae. And then we have the longissimus thoracus. Now, the longissimus thoracus originates from the lumbar transverse processes and it inserts on the thoracic transverse processes and the posterior aspects of ribs 9 and 10. Basically, it fills the groove formed uh, by the thoracic vertebrae where it meets the ribs. And then we start getting into the area called the spinalis muscles, which is just on top of the spine or adjacent to it, the one that's most medial. Now, as I said, the spinalis muscles are the closest to the vertebrae of all the erector spinae muscles and consist of two muscles, the cervicus and the thoracus. Now, the spinalis cervicus points are from the lower ligamentum nuci, right up in here, the spinous processes of C6 and C7, and the insertions, it inserts basically into the spinous processes of the axis above. Now we start getting into the spinalis thoracus, and this originates from the inner portion of the lumbosacral fascia, down below here, as well as from the spinous processes of T11 to L2. It inserts uh, basically into the spinous processes in the upper vertebrae from T2 up here to T8. While we we're here working on the erector spinae, I wanted to also include a muscle, a section right up into here called the semispinalis capitis. And the reason I want to do this right now is because the Spinalis capitis and the semispinalis capitis are basically connected right together. So, uh, if they look at the origin of both of these muscles, the splenius capitis and the semispinalis capitis, capitis, they originate respectively from the spinous processes of C7 and T1 and the transverse processes of C7 to T4. And they insert basically up here onto the occiput. Now, in terms of the action of this area here, if they contract bilaterally while the cervical spine is fixed, they extend the head. If they contract unilaterally with the spine fixed, they contribute to side bending and rotation. So the next muscle we're going to go over is actually two of them. This is the splenius capitis and the splenius cervicus. Now, the splenius capitis over on the side here originates from the nuchal ligament and the spinous processes of C7 through T4. It inserts up in the base of the skull here on the mastoid process adjacent to the occipital bone. Now, the splenius cervicus runs from the spinous processes of T5, T7 to the transverse processes all the way up of C1 to C3. So now let's go over two muscles, the serratus posterior superior and the serratus posterior inferior. The serratus posterior superior runs from the spinous processes of C7 to T3 and inserts on the first five ribs. Now the action of the serratus posterior superior is that it elevates the ribs 
and thereby aids in inspiration. Now, if we go down here, we'll run into the serratus posterior inferior. Now, this runs from the spinous processes of T12 to L2 and inserts on the four lower ribs. The actions of this muscle is that it depresses the ribs and thereby aids in expiration. Let's discuss the levator scapulae. Now, the muscle originates from the transverse processes of C1 through C4, and it inserts on the superior angle of the scapula. Its actions are to elevate and downwardly rotate the scapula at the scapulocostal joint. It also helps to extend, laterally flex, and ipsolaterally rotate the neck at the spinal joints. Let's discuss the rhomboid muscles, the rhomboid major and rhomboid minor. Now, starting with the rhomboid minor, the origin is up here at the nuchal ligament, and it travels down and is actually also attached to the spinous processes of the seventh cervical and first thoracic vertebrae. The insertion of the rhomboid minor is to the scapula, more along the vertebral border and the root of the spine of the scapula. Now, inferior to the rhomboid minor, we have the rhomboid major. So, the origin of the rhomboid major, major is along the spinous processes of the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, and 5th thoracic vertebrae, and it also comes off of the supraspinous ligament in the midline of the back. The rhomboid major inserts onto the scapula, and it follows the vertebral border of the scapula from the root of the spine of the scapula to its inferior angle. Now, if we, did have, if we discuss the rhomboids, the major and the minor, the muscles are situated underneath the superficial layer of the trapezius, but they're actually over top the sacrospinalis, so they're almost sandwiched between the two muscle layers. The small rhomboid minor muscle is positioned above the rhomboid major, and it begins at the lower portion of the leucal ligament, as we mentioned. The muscle inserts obliquely, as you can see, onto the medial border of the scapula. Now, the rhomboid major is twice as large as the rhomboid uh, minor, and it begins off the spinous processes, and you can see how it inserts along the medial border of the scapula. The rhomboids, they work together uh, to retract the scapula towards the vertebral column. So, as these muscles contract, they pull the scapula back towards the vertebral column. That is also known as scapular uh, adduction. They also work in conjunction with other muscles. They help to move the scapula in a downward rotation with the acromion and the glenoid cavity. And they also help to move it medially and inwards. Now this type of action occurs when the arms are lowered against resistance. For example, when someone uses a paddle when they're canoeing or they're driving a stake down with a hammer. It can also occur when you reach back into your hip pocket. So the action of downward rotation is one movement, but the scapula can also elevate and adduct at the same time. In the action of shrugging, for example, the rhomboids elevate the scapula bones upwards. They also act to stabilize us stabilize the scapula against the thorax. Let's discuss the latissimus dorsi muscle. Now, the origin of the muscle comes off a few different areas, starting with the spinous processes of the lower six thoracic vertebrae. Then we have all the spinous processes of all five lumbar vertebrae as well as the spinous processes of the sacrum. It also originates off of the iliac crest, the posterior third, as well as the posterior surface of the last three ribs. Now the muscle inserts at the humerus, at the floor of the intertubercular groove. Now the muscle is quite interesting in that it also creates the back wall of the armpit just as the pectoralis major creates the armpit's front, or anterior portion of the wall. When the arms are raised overhead, the latissimus dorsi muscles can be seen inserting directly into the base of the arm in the axillary region, while the teres major 
inserts slightly higher up. Now, let's look at the action of the latissimus dorsi. It is a large V-shaped muscle, and it helps to move the arms to different positions. It assists in movements that involve pulling, uh, climbing movements, hammering, pulling back, such as in rowing, and performing chin-ups, as well as movements of the arms during swimming. The latissimus dorsi helps to adduct the arm, it pulls it vertically or horizontally, and it also pulls it back to the side of the torso. It also assists in the extension of the arm, which is an action uh, such as when you return a flexed arm uh, in front of the torso back to the side of the torso. So, it also plays a role in medial rotation of the arm, which helps to rotate the arm inwards. Let's discuss the trapezius muscle. First, looking at the origin of the trapezius, it originates at the base of the cranium, at the occipital protuberance, as well as the fibrous band of the nuchal ligament. And then it follows all the way down, originating from all the spinous processes of the seventh vertebra all the way to the twelfth thoracic vertebrae. Now, the muscle inserts onto the clavicle laterally, the acromion of the spine of the scapula on the inner border, as well as the spine of the scapula. Looking at the muscle, you'll notice that it is a diamond-shaped muscle, and it's located in the upper back region. At one time, it was called the curcularis muscle, and in Latin, curculus meaning hood, because it does resemble the hood of a monk. Now, the trapezius is a major muscle, and to locate it visually, it serves three areas of the body the back of the neck, the shoulders, and the upper back. The fibers of the muscle are divided into three portions, and they're generally referred to as the upper portion, the middle portion, and the lower portion. Now, if we look at the upper trapezius to begin with, it starts at the base of the skull and at the fibrous neck ligament called the nuchal ligament. From there, the fibers descend at an oblique angle and insert into the outer lateral third of the clavicle. Looking at the middle portion or transverse portion of the trapezius, you can see that it begins at locations along the spinous processes of the vertebrae, from the seventh cervical vertebrae all the way down to the third thoracic vertebrae. From there, the muscles travel more or less horizontally and they travel across the back to insert into the acromion of the spine of the scapula. The upper and middle portions of this muscle contribute importantly to that characteristic mass of the muscle bulk here in the shoulder region. Now, if we look at the lower portion of the trapezius, we can see that it begins along the spinous processes of the vertebrae from about the third thoracic uh, vertebra all the way down to the twelfth. And from these locations, the muscle fibers ascend. They actually go up at an oblique angle and insert into the spine of the scapula. Now, the trapezius changes its shape depending on the position of the arms as well as the scapular bones. So, taking the actions of the muscle into consideration now, the main function of the trapezius is to move the scapular bones. Now, each of the three portions of the trapezius contribute to a specific action. In the action of adduction, the middle fibers contract, causing the form to thicken and compress. This movement is sometimes called a squaring of the shoulders, and it's very characteristic in a military standing at attention position. Now, in the action of upward rotation, the fibers of the upper portion of the trapezius appear to thicken up here in the shoulder region while the fibers of the lower portion actually stretch out as the trapezius helps the scapula to pivot away from the vertebral column. If we look at uh, the tension that develops in the shoulder region as the trapezius muscles press against the deltoid, the action of shrugging the shoulders, for example, which we call elevation, will help to contract the fibers of the upper trapezius and will help to lift the scapula bones upwards. When the lower portion of the muscle helps to return the scapula from this elevated position, this action is called depression of the scapula.
So, as you can see, the trapezius helps in many actions. It also helps in tilting the head backwards, which would be extension of the neck. And as this occurs, you can see that the scapula bones would remain stationary in this movement and stabilized in part by the fibers of the middle portion of the trapezius. Let's discuss the scalene muscles. Now, the scalenes consist of three muscles. The scalenus anterior and scalenus medius originate from the transverse processes of C3 to C6 and C2 to C7, respectively. The muscles insert close together on the anterior part of rib 1. The scalenus posterior runs from the transverse processes of C4 to C6 and then to the lateral surface of the second rib. The muscles are innervated by the brachial plexus. Now, looking at the actions of the scalene muscles, if we consider the anterior scalene, it acts to flex, laterally flex, and contralaterally rotate the neck at the spinal joints, as well as elevating the first rib at the sternocostal and costovertebral joints. The middle scalene, scalenus medius, flexes and laterally flexes the neck at the spinal joints, while it elevates the first rib at the sternocostal and costovertebral joints. And if we look at the posterior scalene, it acts to laterally flex the neck at the spinal joints, and it also acts to elevate the second rib at the sternocostal and costovertebral joints. Let's discuss the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Now, the muscle consists of two heads, the sternal head and the clavicular head. If we look at the origin of the sternal head, it originates off of the sternum at the anterior surface of the manubrium, while the origin of the clavicular head is off of the inner medial third of the, uh, of the clavicle. Now, the muscle inserts up at the mastoid process of the cranium, as well as the superior nuchal line of the occipital bone. And as you can see, it is a muscle on this side, as well as another muscle on the opposite side. So there's two sternocleidomastoids. Now, the sternal head has a tapered cord-like tendon that attaches on the upper portion of the sternum, also known as the breastbone. The tendon of the clavicular head on the side, just lateral here, is broader and flatter and attaches on the clavicle. The extremely small triangular space between these two tendons in this area here uh, is called the lesser supraclavicular fossa. It is sometimes possible to see this on the surface form, but it is the tendons of the sternal head that are usually most noticeable in this region. The tendons of the sternal heads have a small space between them as they attach into the manubrium. And this is the upper part of the sternum here. Now, if we look at the actions of the sternocleidomastoids, uh, it is involved in elevation of the sternum and clavicle and assists in inspiration when the skull is fixed. When the thoracic cage is fixed, unilateral contraction of the SCM would cause ipsilateral bending on one side while creating contralateral rotation on the other side, as well as some slight extension. If both muscles were to contract at the same time, bilateral contraction, this would result in extension of the head, which accentuates the cervical lordosis, as we can see here. Let's discuss the quadratus lumborum muscle. Looking at the attachment sites of the muscle, it attaches at the inferior medial border of the 12th rib and the transverse processes of L1, 2, 3, and 4, and then onto the posterior medial iliac crest. The actions of this muscle are that it elevates and anteriorly tilts the pelvis at the lumbosacral joint. It also extends 
and laterally flexes the trunk at the spinal joints, and it acts to depress the 12th rib at the costovertebral joint. 